Hey friends, welcome to the Spill the OT YouTube channel. My name is Robin, and today we are talking about study tips and tricks for college. Now, it has been a while since I've been in college. I graduated in 2012, so it's been a bit, but I did do really well in college. I had a 3.86 at graduation, so I took getting good grades and studying hard pretty seriously, and I definitely learned some things along the way. We got baby chickens last week, and they are chirping in the other room. Can you hear them? I don't know how to make them stop. They're just going to go this whole video. One eternity later. All right. Sorry, team. I ditched the chicken, so hopefully we won't be hearing them again. So before we get too far into this video, I just want to say that occupational therapy programs are robust. The doctoral and the master's degrees require so much time and attention and mental energy and persistence. Please do not let your grades in these programs define who you are as a person. Your grade is not a measure of your worth. And I know that we have to maintain a certain GPA in order to stay in the program. So of course, grades are important. It's a good measure to see if you're on track with learning the materials, but please do not get obsessed with the grade number and the GPA level. It just really doesn't matter. What matters is how you make a patient or client feel. So if you can work on your empathy, as long as you're a good person and you're in occupational therapy for the right reasons and you wanna help people and you want people to get better Better and stronger and you want kids to learn and grow as long as you're kind-hearted and willing to learn and work then you are going to be an amazing therapist and there's no need to obsess over your grades but sometimes we all need a little bit of support so let's jump into some of these tips and tricks number one is coming up with a system think of a way that you can get organized I love color coordination, so that greatly helps me. So I would have a different binder color for every single subject that I was taking. So if I was taking AMP1, that might be my blue binder. And if I had my musculoskeletal class, that might be my purple binder. There's really no right or wrong way to do this. I just think that do whatever feels the most natural to you. So some people will only do their stuff online. So if you are familiar with Google, you can have all your things in Google, color code everything in Google, and just have a folder where everything is put into that Google Drive. So my program came out right when Google Drive was like kind of pretty new. At least I wasn't really using it a whole ton. So I would organize my digital files right on my laptop and create colored folders on there. But now that we have Google Drive and you can access it everywhere, I think it would be a shame for you not to do some sort of system digitally. And you can always do a hybrid. So you can have some of your folders online and then as well as those tangible documents that you can access and print and put in a binder. So this does take a little bit of extra planning initially, but it will just save you so much hassle and time down the road. I myself, I struggle with organization. So getting organized sometimes takes me a lot of mental capacity and energy. So I like to do it at the beginning before I've even attempted to begin the class. So during the summer when I had lots of free time, that's when I would begin that process because I knew the second school started and I was back with my friends and I wanted to go out, have fun. I knew that becoming systematic and organized was gonna be a bit of a struggle for me. So because I had already done some of that prep work, all I had to do was get my syllabus and I already knew that that syllabus was going into this binder and I didn't have to think twice about it. So tip number two is time blocking. I think that the thoughts and ideas that go swirling through our brains take up so much mental capacity that the first step of ever time blocking is just doing a brain dump. Get everything out of your head onto somewhere, just dump it. So you can grab a pencil and paper and just write literally everything you're thinking about. You can put it on your phone, make a list on your laptop, somewhere where you can just get everything that's inside your head out into the world so that you can see what all is taking up your mental capacity. Once that step is done, you may notice that a lot of the stuff that's going on in your brain actually isn't that big of a priority. And it might be something that can wait weeks, months, or even years down the road, but that it's just taking up this space inside your head. You might also find that there are lots of things that you have to do immediately. So what I like to do is after I have brain dumped, I will star the most important things. So what has to be done today? And a lot of this might be emails or phone calls or following up on something that you know that has to be done immediately. 
So I will star all of those items and put them in a list of top priority. I also do the 10 minute rule. If you know that something is gonna take 10 minutes or less, then I will do it now because the thought of it taking up space in your mind is not worth the 10 minutes it would take to just do the task. So say on your list you have clean up the cat's litter box and that's taking up this mental capacity in your mind. You can go and do that right now. It's gonna take 10 minutes or less. Do it and you'll already be off to a good start and feeling accomplished. So as you are prioritizing your list, you'll see that there are things that are super urgent you have to do today. And then you'll see there's items that can be done for the next couple of days and maybe the next week. Those are all items that, again, you wanna star and put on your more immediate to-do list. And then of course you'll have those items that are for later down the road and it's a great idea to get these written down in some sort of planner there are some great digital planners there is trello it's an app and it can sync across all devices so you can get trello on your phone and you can access it on your laptop while you're in class there is also an app called my homework planner this app is a little bit more limited because it's pretty much only for homework and projects i use this a lot with my middle school and high school students but if you're someone who just needs really clear list of what project is due and when and when your exams will be and what your homework is for that day then this might just be a really easy system to follow along with and again this one syncs across all devices and then my personal favorite and it's just because i'm a google gal is i love google keep i like google keep because you can add pictures so you can snap a picture and add that into your google keep notes it has to-do lists that when you check them off it crosses it off which gives me a lot of satisfaction to see it be crossed off my list and know that it's done so i like google keep again another one that syncs across all devices and i like this because i use my laptop a lot and you can actually pull your google keep right into your google docs and it's just kind of on the right hand side and you can access all your notes that way and then if you're someone who loves pen to paper you can buy a regular planner if you go on amazon if you go to staples even tj maxx or marshall's may have planners that may suit your needs but get whatever planner you need i had a great friend in college and she had a planner that she would get pages for that planner and she would have them for daily weekly monthly yearly checklists and she was able to put it all in her little one book and access that anytime she needed to know what her schedule was going to be like or what was going to be due or expected of her so then the last part of time blocking is actually scheduling your time block. So now that you have brain dumped, you've prioritized your list and you've created what your actual to-do list and schedule is, you want to create time for you to actually spend doing the work. And this does not have to be crazy. Like I used to do the 25 five minute rule approximately. Sometimes I flexed it and whatnot, but I would give myself a task and I would say you have 35 minutes to work on this paper and I would work on that paper I would set a timer when that timer went off I would take a break even if I didn't feel like I needed a break I would go upstairs stretch my legs and I would time that I would give myself five minutes to have my break and then I would get back to work sometimes I would just put on friends I used to have the friends DVDs because I'm old AF and I would put my friends DVDs on and I would give myself a couple of minutes and then I would get back to my paper and, and work on that. So if you want something to keep you held accountable, um, the timer on your phone is a great way. There are also two different apps. One is called Tomato Timer. It's a Chrome extension. And I'm gonna do a whole series on Chrome extensions because I freaking love them. And I will link it here or here somewhere. Once I have that up, I haven't made the video yet, but I will once it's up. And Tomato Timer will block different ads and sites and it will give you 25 minutes of go time and you will not be able to access anything. You can't go on Reddit, on Twitter until the 25 minutes are up and then you will have a five minute break and the tomato will turn green. During that green time, you'll be able to go on all of your more preferred sites and then after five minutes, it's going to turn red and it's back to work. And then there is another tool I like. It's called Stay Focused. It's a similar vibe. This one, you can set how long you wanna work for and you can put different blocked sites on there. So if you love to go shopping, then you can block Amazon. And while you have that Chrome extension engaged, you will not be able to access that website. When you try and log in, it'll say, oops. And um, yeah, it's just a nice way to keep you held accountable, which may or may not be your thing. These are all just suggestions. You don't have to do any of these, but if it's something where you like to have that extra layer of accountability, this might be something that you might find helpful. Okay, so tip number three is note-taking. However you prefer to take your notes, please do that. 
I have heard that the only way you have to take notes is paper and pencil. No, that is fake news. There is very limited research to support that. What they're referring to that very limited research is that people who type tend to type whatever their professor or lecturer is saying verbatim. So when we take notes by hand, we know that we're never going to be able to keep up with the lecturer and be able to handwrite everything. So that is why a lot of us will take a moment, reflect, and then we will write the most important thing. That reflection piece is the part of the research that was important. So if you are going to be typing or using a tablet, that is totally fine. You just want to make sure that you're reflecting and thinking about what you're adding and make sure that that's summarizing it and you're not just doing verbatim. So I found this to be very helpful because I type so much faster than I handwrite. When I handwrite, I mean, I should probably have an OT. I get tired. I even get like a blister on my finger. I'm left handed and I smudge all my notes. I can't stand having it on my hand. So for me, typing has always been the easiest way for me to get my work done. So knowing that I'm not going to be missing out or that I'm not going to learn the information quite as well was really helpful. And feel free to use your laptop as much or as little as you want. Just don't take the notes verbatim. A lot of times what I did was I would always have a digital copy of my notes on my computer and then sometimes I would just take notes on there but what I found really helpful was I would print my notes put them in my color-coded binder and then I would doodle for me to like access that subconscious part of my brain which is actually really helpful for studying and and learning the content is I just had to doodle and it may have looked like I wasn't paying attention but it really helped me process the information better. So I would have my notes and I would doodle. And then when I would go to take a test, I'd be like, oh, that's on the page where I drew that picture of the ocean. And honestly, that's what helped me personally. I do have a hint of ADHD, so that could also be why, but do whatever you feel is helpful to you. But you can always print your PowerPoints and then you can take notes directly on your PowerPoints of whatever the teacher is saying is important. And then you can combine that handwriting piece if that's something that you prefer to do. Okay, tip number four, do not read everything. Your teachers are going to assign you so much reading. And as somebody who seriously struggles with reading, I'm gonna be honest with you, I read very little in college. I have a hard time reading. Processing the information is very difficult for me and it's not how I learn. I'm not a strong reader and it's just not how I learn best. That's not to say if you love to read, feel free to read as much as you want, but you are gonna be assigned so much reading content that it just really is silly for you to read the entire chapters because a lot of the information is gonna be summarized in the tables. So I like to read the tables at the beginning and the end of each chapter. And if there's ever case studies, those case studies are usually filled with great information. It helps you process what the chapter is actually looking for and what they want you to learn. So you can probably just skim through the titles and um, read those actual tables with the case studies, any images that they include on there, read those, and you can save yourself so much time. And then whatever is in the PowerPoints, your teacher has already summarized, and that's the information that they are hoping you can learn and access for the exam, which leads me to tip number five, which is study the PowerPoints. Your professors have already gone through so much work to basically hand deliver what they are looking for for that exam. So know your PowerPoints. That's the content that they are really going to want you to know because they thought it was so important that out of all of the chapters, that is what they chose to include on their PowerPoints. Another tip is when you are taking an exam, if you are at all confused, please go and check and clarify with your professor. They are there to help you. And I was somebody that did not do this enough. I am very quiet by nature and I don't really like to bother people. So I would like silently listen. And if anybody were to go and ask the professor for help, typically it was one of the questions that I had anyway. So I would like listen in because I always sat in the second row. So I was pretty close that I could hear. And the professors basically gave the answer away. You know, if you're between two choices and you go and ask that clarifying question, they want you to succeed and pass, and they obviously know that you know the information because you're stuck between these two options. So they are gonna help you get to that answer. Of course, they're not gonna give you the answer, but they're gonna give you an extra hint or an extra layer of some substance that will help you get to the right answer on the test. So please feel free to go and ask them 
uh, you know, you don't want to be up there the entire exam, but if you have one or two pressing questions for that exam, absolutely, it is okay to ask questions and ask for a little bit of clarification. Okay, so our next tip is the halo effect. When you meet a new person, there is something in psychology called the halo effect, and it's basically a person's overall impression of you as a whole, and they make assumptions about you, and as much as we don't want this to occur, it's something that psychologically just happens. So first impressions are key. So when you are new to a professor or new to a program or even just new to a class, you want to sit where the professor can see you. So sit in one of the first couple of rows, make sure that you're keeping eye contact with your professor. Nodding along is something that is very fulfilling to the talker. So if you're nodding along and you seem engaged throughout the lecture, not only are they gonna feel better, but they're gonna have more confidence in themselves to keep talking and keep teaching and they're going to have this impression of you as somebody who is listening and learning the content. So say it's the end of the semester and there's a little bit of wiggle room, there's a project and they're in between giving you an 89 and a 90 and it's gonna change your grade from a B plus to an A minus. If they know that you are somebody who is engaged to somebody who has great attendance in class and seems participatory and is not interrupting or talking to their friends throughout the whole class, then this halo effect is going to leave an impression on them as somebody who is hardworking and deserves a grade that reflects all of that hard work. So be respectful while in class. Don't be texting, don't be sleeping, don't be on your phone the whole time. Try and stay engaged and it may overall boost your grade at the end of the day. Another tip is studying before bed. So there has been research to support that when we study and then we go to sleep immediately after studying, it helps to kind of cement that knowledge within our brain. Again, I think it kind of gets into our subconscious and then we're able to recall it better later. So when you are studying, study right before bed and do not watch TV in between. So I had read that research and then a lot of times I would, you know, put on friends or something right immediately before bed. So skip that part, just go from studying right to bed. So maybe you watch friends before you study or maybe if you're somebody who likes to nap, you study at two o'clock and then take a three o'clock nap and then you can get on with the rest of your day. But if you can study a little bit before you sleep, that should be helpful. Okay, so my last piece of advice is please have fun. You are only in college once, and I know that it seems so stressful, and especially in a grad program, maybe you are working full time, maybe you're a parent, or maybe you have some responsibilities that are really heavy and big right now, but please take time to have fun. Don't let this be all consuming. You would never let a job be all consuming. So please don't let school be all consuming as well. So I am somebody that always gets my work done. I would make sure that all my work was done before I was willing to go play. But if you know any of my friends in college, they would tell you I had a great time. So it is so possible to get all your responsibilities done and out of the way. I really do think the time blocking piece though is important to that. So allowing yourself dedicated time to get it done doesn't allow that room for procrastination. I always say that we get whatever we want done in the timeline that we allow ourselves. So if you allow yourself three weeks to write a paper, it's gonna take you three weeks to write a paper. If you allow yourself two days to write a paper, it's gonna take you two days to write a paper. Whatever timeline you're given is what you'll get it done with. So I actually used to set fake deadlines. So if I had a paper that was due on Monday, I would set the deadline for Friday and I would have it done by Friday. That way I could go play, have fun with my friends. And then Sunday night, I would edit that paper, make sure that's exactly what I wanted and then I would hand it in. So please have fun. This is college and it is a time to celebrate and enjoy and not just college, but throughout our whole lives. I feel like sometimes we are so work driven and so productivity driven that we really do need to schedule time, put in your time block, but make sure you're leaving room for enjoyment and love because life really is short. And although this is you know a big part of life and you're spending a lot of time and money, Remember, it's not everything. This does not define you and you are amazing and okay. I hope that you have a great week. If you like this video, please like, share, subscribe, all those things. And please comment down below what videos you might like more of. Have a great week, bye.